Okay, so the last session together, we looked at this building world governmental system that's going to be a single governing entity over the entire globe. And the League of Nations was started right uh, quite a ways back as an attempt to start this. Then that morphed into the United Nations. Now we have the World Health Organization, the World Bank. We have all of these global institutions, and we are constantly hearing little references to this coming world government. And it will happen. It's impossible humanly, but we're going to see this morning why it finally happens. And, but I want to start because it's very easy as a believer to look out at the world and actually get angry with people because of what they're doing, how they act, how completely irrational and evil they can become, human trafficking, all of the things that we see. So why? Why is that? And that's what we want to look at because this is going to be foundational to why this world government system finally comes into existence. So we want to start in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. And here's, God is telling us this so we can understand. In which you once walked, he's, he's already described in the verses before, all of the evil kinds of things that people in the world get in, entangled with, involved with. And he says, you used to live that way also, following the course of this present age, following the prince of the power of the air. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. The spirit, hear this, the spirit that is now at work inside the sons of disobedience. There is a spirit in this world that energizes and empowers people to live in antagonism to God. And the things that are going to destroy their life, they feel a drawing to it. They feel a pull towards that which is going to actually destroy them. So it's an inward working of this dark energy. It fuels rebellion at every level in our schools, Wall Street, governments, communism. 60 million people killed, it's estimated, under Mao. 30 million under Stalin. 30 million. The Holocaust, 6 million Jews killed for no reason. Just dark energy energizing Pol Pot in Cambodia wiped out a quarter of their population in the first six months, I think, first year. It causes profound blindness and anger against all that's pure and godly. We see it out here. You stand up and go out in the street and sing Christian songs or preach and say, God loves you, he wants to give you a new life, and they want to kill you. It aligns their mind with arrogant foolishness and a darkened heart, as the scripture describes it, which is terrifying to have. A darkened heart. Romans 1.28. They do not want God in their mind. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a debased mind Things that never should be done. Things that are done to children. Things that are done to rip people off and scam them. The Nigerian letter brought in $2 billion. That goofy letter, hey, I'm a Nigerian prince. Scamming people. I worked with senior clients for 29 years. So many of them got scammed by this or that. But here's what this verse is really saying. I don't want God in my thoughts. So don't bring up anything that causes me to have to think, what if there's a God? I, don't, I want that out of all of my thinking. That's what it really is saying. I want him away from my plans, my goals. This coveting lust that drives the entire world. And the fear that they might have to give up their own control in their life. 
I don't want God in my mind. So they, they've looked at it and said, all of nature out here is screaming that there's got to be intelligent design. I'd call it brilliant design. I know there's got to be a God. And so I've weighed it out. I've looked at it. If there's a God, then I'm responsible to him. I have to not live and control my own life. I would have to ask him to forgive me. I know I've committed a lot of sins. I've lied up and down. I've done all these things. So I'm weighing it out carefully. And I don't want him in my thoughts. So I'm pushing him out. And now anything that reminds me of it, I am going to have a reaction to it. Get out of here. Get out of my face. That's why you see what you see out on the street when you talk to certain people. They tested the idea and they disapproved it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. For this mystery, this sacred secret of lawlessness is already at work out here in the world. Only there is, by the way, I'm reading from a very literal, you can read up here too. There is one, there's a remnant of believers that are in love with Jesus Christ. They are passionate about God. And they are restraining through their prayers, through talking with people, with trying to reason. There's this restraining force in the world stopping this spirit of lawlessness from completely taking over. And that's the only thing that's restraining it right now. Like someone said, there's a very thin veneer between our current civilization and the jungle. And they will restrain until they are taken out of the way. That's the rapture. Out of the midst, suddenly gone is what it means. Even he, it's speaking of Satan and the Antichrist, who's coming, it actually means presence. This is a, where parousia is used, that rapture word, but in a negative, this presence of the Antichrist coming is according to, and this Greek word is energeia, I believe it's pronounced, it means an inward energizing of Satan. The Antichrist is going to have a powerful inward energizing. And that's why people are going to hear him. And he's going to be able to do miracles. And he's going to have wisdom like no one else has been able to speak and with power and authority. You ever hear Hitler's speeches? They're so bizarre when you listen to them. Why did a whole culturally fairly high nation of Germany get moved and buy in? Because he was energized by a spirit that got into them from him. And to them it made sense. What will this inward energy of Satan, how will it show itself outwardly? Here's what it keeps going in verse 9. With all power, that means dunamis. It's the word we, Greek word dunamis where we get dynamite from. He's going to have dynamite power, force, miracles, and signs. A sign means a miracle that typically is corroborating what someone's saying. Jesus did miracles and it corroborated his gospel. The Antichrist is going to do miracles and it's going to corroborate his gospel of a new age for this earth. The age of Aquarius. He will be the great teacher, the great avatar. It will authenticate it. And then lying wonders. It means something done that elicits a potent reaction from those standing by. It's so powerful, it's a lying wonder, a miracle that's actually a lie, but the effect that it has on all the people witnessing it is powerful and profound. That's what that word means. Now note, 
Do you get any sense from those Greek words that the Antichrist is not going to come as just, Hi, I'm Governor Jay Inslee. Uh, Would you guys follow me? No. Boom! Power, miracles, signs, calling down fire from heaven. That's what it says in Revelation 13. Verse 10 in 2 Thessalonians 2. And with all deception of wickedness. This word means delusion, fraud of injustice, and just unrighteousness. He's going to deceive people with unrighteousness. Who gets deceived? For those who are being lost, perishing. We are being saved. Remember a few weeks ago, all those verses were being saved, carry out. They are carrying out their lostness in eternity. (laughs) That's hard. That's really hard to consider if it becomes real. Why are they going to be lost? Why will they be separated from God who says, I don't want anyone to perish. That's my will. Because they did not receive a love of the truth. Truth doesn't smash down the door. It knocks. It says, here I am. You're hearing your friend tell what Jesus has done in, your li- in his life, her life. You're hearing this worship song somewhere and something is calling deep into your spirit. It's knocking. But it won't smash the door down. We have to open the door and let truth come in. They wouldn't receive not just a begrudging, okay, fine, you've proved it all. No, he says we need to have a love. The word is agape, agapao, an agape love for truth. Truth is dangerous when lawlessness is coming to the full. There's going to be a lot of pressure not to receive the truth. You know how it's getting out here? If you say, I don't believe that, I believe this, you become dangerous. In the book of Isaiah, it says, this was back in Israel. They become so evil in God's own nation that it said anyone who is embracing truth, has literally put a target on them. That's what it says. Put a target. If they would have received the truth, it would have allowed them to be saved from eternal separation from God. And that literally means motion. It's ice, sozo. It means motion into salvation. They would not start the process. So God could give them more light. They just said, no, I love my darkness. I love this lust, this violence. I love just living in my game world. I don't want to know anything else. I'm just just up at four in the morning gaming. My marriage is trashed. I'm unhappy. I'm empty. No, don't tell me anything about God. I'm just going to live this ugly. That's what it's talking about. It's a scary thing. As a result of this in verse 11, this is a verse that's stunning if people, even most Christians, will allow themselves to understand what it's saying. Because, in other words, and this word is not, oh man, I was looking for the truth and I was so confused I never found it. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about, I see the truth and I am refusing it. I refuse to be Persuaded. That's what it means. And because of that, then it says, therefore, God, God, Almighty God, sends them strong delusion. In the heavens, God sends down to their minds deception so that they might believe. And it doesn't say in the Greek what is false. It says that they might believe the lie. The lie. And I have a different picture, and we'll talk about it up ahead very quickly here, what the lie is. 
I believe it ties into evolution, but it's completely different in certain aspects. Verse 12, that they all might be judged who didn't receive, and it's the word apathea. Thea means like thea, believing God. Apa is like opposed to faith. And it means I won't believe the truth. I have pleasure in sin. I love it. You ever see out here, Las Vegas, New Orleans, New York, Seattle, they love the pleasures of unrighteousness, evil. And it says they all have to be judged. In other words, ultimately, every person who's ever lived will get what they actually want. Oh, I don't believe that. Yes, one of my favorite sayings that's really a hard saying, but it's so powerful. You can have anything you want. You just can't have everything you want. You can have five affairs, but you can't have a great, intimate, vulnerable marriage. But you can have the affairs. You can choose to be um, a selfish I don't know why I'm on gaming today. Gaming dad that locks himself in his bedroom, but you can't be a great dad and have great kids. You'll have hurting kids. You can have anything you want. You can't have everything you want. These people at this time in history are going to have, I believe, two very powerful witnesses. One is this ministry of the man-child, this group of totally committed Christians right at the end of the age that come into the fullness of the stature of Christ, and then what's called the two witnesses who are on earth during the tribulation period, and they are not two men. I'm sorry, I know everybody teaches they're Enoch and Elijah or uh, Moses, and no. These are two companies, Jewish believers and Gentile believers that are on earth during the tribulation. And we'll look at that a little later, and I think you'll find that uh, it, it's pretty easy to see that um, it's not that, even though almost everybody teaches it. Okay, I want to transition. I made quite a few PowerPoint slides. I want you to actually see, last week we talked about some of this, but I want you to get the impact by seeing right next to each other how powerful God's word really is. The book of Daniel was written probably 700 years before the book of Revelation or the New Testament. So we're gonna start in Daniel 7 and we're gonna look at this antichrist system the reason I wanted to talk about this energizing inside, we're going to see over the next few minutes, this energizing of this Antichrist and this system by Satan himself. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel, by the way, Belshazzar was the last king in Babylon his father was Nebuchadnezzar that built this image we're going to look at in a minute. Remember Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar was so proud, God caused him to go insane for seven years. Remember the story? And he literally was like an animal. His fingernails grew like claws. He lived out, ate grass, was wet with rain. He was a mess. And then God restored his mind and he gave glory to the one true God. This is his son who has now taken over ruling in Babylon. Daniel beheld a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then the dream he wrote, uh, uh, let's go to verse two. Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in my vision, which came with the night, when the four winds of the heavens bursting upon the great sea. Remember last week we saw that the sea 
in prophecy represents all the nations and peoples on earth. And it's like this troubled sea. There's wars, there's famines, there's all these things going on. And he saw this big sea. And then four large wild beasts coming up out of the sea, diverse from each other. Daniel's thinking, what is this? The first, in verse 4, was like a lion having the wings of an eagle. I looked until the wings thereof were torn out. It was lifted up from the earth and upon its feet like a man was caused to stand and a man's heart was given to it. This is describing Babylon and giving this prophetic word of what was going to happen to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 5, And another wild beast, a second resembling a bear. And on one side it was raised up with three ribs in his mouth between his teeth. And thus were they saying to it, rise, devour much flesh. This was Medo-Persia. And the story is fascinating about Babylon. Remember, Belshazzar had a huge feast with all of the leaders in Babylon, all the happening people governors, like today it'd be the athletes, the wealthy, the Bill Gates, the, all the, and he actually called and said, hey, bring all of the golden goblets and cups that we stole from God's temple in Jerusalem. We're going to drink out of those tonight. And they were just having a drunken orgy. And right in the middle of it, a hand that they all could see, came down on the wall in the palace and starts writing. And it says, Belshazzar was so terrified. It says his hips were loosed and his knees started knocking together. He was so terrified. And the message on the wall, and Daniel had to interpret it. It said, Mini, Mini, Tikal Eupharsin. And it meant, Belshazzar and all of you, You have been weighed on the scales and you have been found lacking. And when Daniel interpreted it, Belshazzar gave him a robe. Daniel said, I don't want it, but he did anyway, gave him a robe. Belshazzar knew and he said, you're losing your kingdom. God's going to rip it away from you. And he gave him a golden chain, a robe. That night, Medo-Persia came in and took over Babylon. And here's why it's so astonishing. I'll just give you this in two minutes. Babylon was called the eternal city because nobody could conquer it. A river ran right through the city. It had two walls. The outer wall was like 300 feet high. And it went about 20 feet down into the earth and was like 20 feet thick and then went up Then there was a large space and then another wall, not quite as tall, I can't remember, maybe 150 feet high or something. Why did they say it was eternal? They had water in the river. They couldn't be thirsted out. And they had so much room between the two walls, they grew all their own food. Babylon was big. They found the ruins. Man, it's awesome. How could you destroy it? On the night they were feasting, every night they had drawbridges that let people go from one side of Babylon to the other. But at night they always pulled those bridges up so no enemy could sneak through on the river and somehow, ah, let's leave them down tonight because people were partying and going back and forth in the city. The Medes and Persians diverted that river and built a dam very quickly, stopped it. They had it all prepared. And so the river stopped flowing. They went in, hundreds of them, and threw up ropes to the bridge, climbed up. A few guys went and opened the gates. And the city went to bed, Babylon, and woke up in the morning, Medo-Persia. And they put Belshazzar to death that next day, I believe. He was found wanting. And they lost their whole kingdom. 
It's a really fascinating story. So this second beast looked like a bear, but it was on one side higher. The Medes, I think the Persians were a little stronger than the Medes. Maybe I got it backwards. Verse 6, after that I was looking, and then another like a leopard, and it had four wings on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. This was Greece. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. I just saw a fascinating documentary, especially because I'm teaching on this, of how Alexander conquered. And Darius was the king of Medo-Persia, and he had two massive battles with Alexander the Great, lost both of them, even though he was outmanned, and he chased him to these famous places we hear, these cities, Sardis, and then he ended up Susa, where the palace was, and it's fascinating what Alexander was able to do. That was Greece. They conquered Medo-Persia. Well, now let's look at Revelation 13 too. See, God wrote this book, not men. Now he's describing this end time antichrist government, but he says the beast, this, and when, when you hear beast, just think it's a, it's a description of a powerful end time government. Was like a leopard. We just saw that. That was Greece. And it had feet like a bear, Medo-Persia. And he had a mouth like a mouth of a lion. That was Babylon. God wrote this book, put it together. Why is he saying that? Because this end time system is going to have traits that were part of all of those governments. The power, the this, the wisdom, the Greek philosophy has massively impacted our world and massively impacted the church with Greek philosophy instead of the word of God. We'll talk about that later sometime. <laughs> Daniel 8, verses 5 through 8. This is a different picture, but the same thing. Now he sees a he-goat coming in, and it had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. Then he came up to the ram that had two horns, that was Medo-Persia, standing before the river and ran into him with fury. And that's how Alexander always attacked. He, he invented these 18-foot spears for his infantry. Nobody could handle them. They would come in a block, a tight block with 18-foot spears, and they would just rush right into the army, and it so discombobulated them getting hit with spears before they could even get to the men. It just took their courage away. And so this is another description, um, and it says, none could deliver, verse 8, I think this is so amazing how God writes, but the he-goat in verse 8 showed himself very great. That's why he was called Alexander the Great. This is written before Alexander existed. And when he had become mighty, the great horn was broken, and there came up afterwards four in its stead towards the four winds of heaven. And then later it says, it will not be handed off to his lineage, his posterity. Usually a great general hands it off to his kids, a ruler. These four were four generals. When Alexander died, suddenly four generals took over and went to different parts of that huge conquered area and they began to rule together. God described it perfectly. You know what? I think we're going to have to stop here. We'll pick this up next time. Come back. It gets better. Stay blessed.